We're gonna play a little rock and roll right now. Just let me hear some of that rock and roll. Rock and roll. Rock and roll music. Rock and roll. Welcome back to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast. I am your host, Don DiMuccio, and here we are, the first show of 2023. Can you believe it? Seems like we just started this thing. But over the last three years, we've talked with some of rock's biggest names, and today will be no exception. In fact, it's a milestone. More on that in a minute. As we start year four, I want to thank all of you people who have stuck with the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast episode after episode. We couldn't have come this far without you, and we're going to keep bringing you the best artists, musicians, and industry insiders from the world of rock, because it's important to document and keep their stories alive for all time. I mean, look in the last few weeks, man, we've lost Jeff Peck, David Crosby, Robbie Bachman, Top Topham of the Oddbirds just passed, all of whom I've tried to get on the show, by the way. Talk about your moot points now. So what I'm trying to say is, if you like what we do, be sure to subscribe to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, so you can listen in the car on your way to and from work. And if you're in front of the old Philco TV, look us up on YouTube and be sure to click like and subscribe. Now, as you know, I make no secret about being a fanatic when it comes to The Doors. No need to rehash my teenage obsession with their music. I drilled that point home when we had John Densmore on the show about a year ago. But as an individual, the earned respect for the guitar playing and the songwriting skills and his seemingly nonstop musical exploration deems Robbie Krieger one of the most important figures in the world of music today. There is nothing I can say about The Doors that hasn't already been covered famously by the likes of biographer Danny Sugarman or horribly in the case of filmmaker Oliver Stone, but what cannot be stressed enough is that each individual member brought their own unique gifts to the table, which collectively made The Doors one of the most influential and mythical bands in rock. And today's guest was one such member whose guitar style went beyond his master of bottleneck blues to include elements of flamenco, jazz, and of course rock and roll. His gift for songwriting provided The Doors with some of the most iconic hits like Lover Madly, Touch Me, Tell All the People, one of my favorites, Love Me Two Times, and The Rock Staple, Light My Fire. Please welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast, author of Set the Night on Fire, Living, Dying, and Playing Guitar with The Doors, the legendary Robbie Krieger. Hello, Robbie. Hey, what's up? Thanks for doing the show. We appreciate it. All right. Podcast. It's a podcast. All the cool kids are doing it these days. Yeah. Well, before we get too deep into things, I do want to mention, uh, as we're recording this interview, it's been about a week now, we lost the great Jeff Beck, who, like yourself, was another groundbreaking guitarist. Just want to get your thoughts on him. Did you guys cross paths much over the years? You know what? I never got to to really know him. You know, I I met him a couple times, but never really uh, got to hang out with him or anything. But um, he was one of my favorites. I've seen him play, you know, a couple of times. Yep. And uh, always amazing. I know. Great loss. I mentioned your book in the open. It's great. It's been out a little over a year now. It's in paperback. You've had some time to digest the whole experience. Are you overall happy with the response? Do you wish you had said more or taken things out? <laughs> What's your overall takeaway? Well, you know, you, you always wish that you had uh, said something or, you know, you forgot to put somebody in. But we actually have a remedy for that. It's an app called Strax, S-T-R-A-X. Okay. And um, you put that on your phone and, and you can aim it at uh, various pages or, or the back or the front of the book and uh, more info will come up, you know? Really? Yeah. Is that kind of, for the hot cover cool. and soft cover? I think so, yeah. That is very cool. I'm going to go try that later. Yeah. Personally, my takeaway is, if I'm reading between the lines correctly, it seems like you're a no-bullshit kind of guy, and you're kind of fed up with the whole myth and over-dramatization of The Doors, and you just want to get the record straight. Is that pretty much correct? Well, I love (laughs) (laughs) over-dramatization. As long as it's accurate. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I mean, you know, to me, truth is better than fiction, you know? Yeah. And uh, there, there was plenty of stuff with the doors going on that uh that that was 
you know, the truth, that was even weirder than some of the stories they made up, you know? So I, that's what I tried to do in the book. About two years ago, I was listening to an old Casey Kasem's American Top 40 from 1971. And I think you guys were uh, somewhere in the top 20 at that time. Bless his heart, he comes out with something like, you know, written by lead singer Jim Morrison, that's Lover Madly by The Doors. And I just about <laughs> jumped through the radio because, you know, obviously you wrote it. Yeah. And did you find that people assumed that because Jim was the poet, the wordsmith and all that, that, you know, he wrote everything? Well, I think it, it used to be that way a lot more than it is today, you know, <clears throat> because, um, you know, Jim wanted, wanted the, on the album covers, he wanted to always say written by the doors, songs written by the doors. But of course, people assumed that it was, it was him. Right. Uh, more than us. And, you know, the reason he said that was because he knew that without us, he never would have wrote those songs, or, or he might have, but they never would have come to the light of day. Right. And, uh, you know, and then, then as, uh, as time went on, I, I started writing more uh, more of the words uh, as well as the music. And um, and then I think it was on the fourth album, we, we started to divide up the songwriting credits. So the first three albums, it says, everything says, written by the doors. And then if you look closely after that, we each got credit for whichever song we wrote. Was the publishing split evenly? Yep, sure was, still is. That's great. Not for me. Well, <laughs> true enough. <Yeah. laughs> no, I, I think it's fine. You yeah. know, it's I, I probably would never have written those songs had I never, you know, if I was not in the doors. So what the hell? That's it. I want to go back to life in the late 50s, early 60s for you. I know you described in the book came from kind of a maybe upper middle class household. It was kind of weird. It was, uh, you know, we lived, like you say, in this upscale kind of waspy town called Pacific Palisades in West Los Angeles. And, um, you know, we were we were Jewish, but my parents tried to come off as white. <laughs> you know, they didn't want people to know they were Jewish, especially, even though they had, you know, they had a lot of Jewish friends, but living in this area, you know, I, I would hear things like, yeah, those kikes, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I had to pretend that I wasn't Jewish, you know. Mm. Kind of, so, I, yeah, I know how it feels to be uh, looked down upon yeah, for your yeah. religion or, or whatever. So it was, it was kind of kind of a good lesson, actually. You mentioned that your parents were Jewish, but you weren't raised particularly religious. Right, right. They tried putting us, me and my brother, in, in Sunday school once <laughs> for <laughs> about one semester, and uh, yeah, that was about it. Do you have a clear memory of the first time you heard rock and roll? Um, pretty much. It was uh, Bill Haley and the Comets. What was that song they had? Rock Around the Clock? Yeah, right. Rock Around the Clock. So uh, it was at the boys club. We were we were in the boys club, which was in Santa Monica, and uh, they had a jukebox there, and people would just play that song over and over again. You know, they had a lot of good songs on there, but Rock Around the Clock was definitely the favorite. You know, I, I loved it. I, I, I must have spent $100 of nickels <laughs> playing, <laughs> playing that song. Now, later on, you went to a private school, Menlo. Right, Menlo and School. And there was a lot of buddy musicians there. There was a, another soon-to-be-famous guy who started a Bay Area band. Right, right. A guy from the Grateful Dead. Although, see, he went there the year before I did, so I never really got to hang out with him. And it wasn't rock and roll. You guys were more into, like, was like a jug band kind of thing? Yeah, you know, at that point in my musical career, I, I was doing flamenco, and we formed a jug band. You know, we kind of looked down on rock and roll at that point. You know, and there was certain things I loved, like Elvis and Little Richard, Chuck Berry. But there was a lot of corny stuff going on at that time, you know. Yeah. I won't say who, but there was a lot of groups that just didn't really jive with, with my uh, idea of what's cool in right. music. So, you know, these there was a lot of guys from the East Coast at that school, and they were into folk music. Stuff that was, you know, played in, in the village. Oh, uh, bluegrass, um, Woody Guthrie stuff, you sure. know, Bob Dylan. And, you know, I'd never heard of any of that stuff. 
Menlo was a real musical education for me, which was pretty cool. What was your first concert? Well, we did this concert with the jug band. It was <laughs> it was for the ladies' auxiliary. Mm. So there's probably 200 mothers there, ladies. We were kind of nervous about how they would like the music. And uh, we were called the Back Bay Chamber Pot Terriers. Wow. Um, one, of, <laughs> one of our guys was from the Back Bay, Boston. You know, I didn't even know what that meant. But, <laughs> I mean, I knew what a chamber pot was. <laughs> um, anyway, so we played the show, and they loved it. You know, they they really seemed to get into it. I mean, you know, it wasn't like a standing ovation or anything, but it was a, a good good experience. So that's like your first positive affirmation that you can actually play music live and yeah. get off on it. But I, I read an interview, I think in 86, where you said you never thought of taking rock and roll as a profession or a smart way to make money. It was more of a diversion. Yeah. What exactly. do you mean by that? Well, you know, my dad was an engineer, and he worked hard. He had a nine-to-five job every day. He worked at Northrop, the Skunk Works. My dad actually designed the wing for the first flying wing at Northrop. Wow. So, you know, I was taking math and physics and all that stuff in school. And, you know, in my mind, I, I figured I'd probably do something like he did. Yeah. But, you know, I love music. But I didn't know anybody that actually made money from music. So I figured, well, it's fun. We'll just keep, you know, do it for fun. Sure. You know, if I had known any better, I probably wouldn't have signed some of those contracts back then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bet. I mean, what were you, 21? 19. Oh, even younger? Yeah. I found it interesting but, reading in your book that, you know, everyone thinks Morrison is the troublemaker. But you had your share of trouble as a kid. You actually spent <laughs> the night in a jail cell. Yeah, a couple Talk. times, yeah. Pot in the underwear, I believe. <laughs> right. What was that about? Well, we went over to this guy's house to score some pot, and um, we didn't realize that there and there were some Mexican guys there, and they were also buying some pot, but that they were buying kilos, you know. We didn't realize it at the time. And these guys were actually narcs. So it just happened that when we were there, th these guys were there, and all of a sudden... The door gets broken down, five plainclothes, cops with guns out, come in, and uh, we got busted. Ah, oh, shit. It was just being at the wrong place at the wrong time, you know. I mean, there was some other stuff I should have gotten busted for, which I didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> we used to be, I don't know why, but probably just because we weren't getting any pussy or something. Um, and me and my friends were just got very destructive. I don't know why. I mean, we would go to these houses that were being built, and we'd leave the water on and, and bust up the place, you know. And, yeah. and then we used to go out and steal stuff from the hardware store, out in the back of the hardware store. I stole a box of wrenches one time, I remember. We had them in the car. And then we knew a guy that had a car because we were younger. You know, we weren't old enough to drive. And Steve Scott, he was my uh, friend Roy's cousin. He was this really crazy guy, and he, he loved to get in car chases. So he, he just flipped somebody off, and the guy would come after him. And one time we ended up throwing wrenches at these the guys that were following us. It was kind of cool. <laughs> But nothing came of it. No, nothing. You know, and it's funny because in the doors, you seem so even keeled. So, you know, do you think you got all that out of your system as a kid? And that's why? You I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It was kind of like Jim hadn't done that, you know. Right. And uh, he acted more like a kid, you know. Yeah, because he had come from a fairly conservative upbringing. Oh, yeah. Very, very conservative. Yeah. Now, John yeah. Densmore brought you, and that's how you connected with Ray and got involved. Right. I didn't realize you actually had an audition for the Doors, and you actually had some competition. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, because Ray's brother, Rick, was originally playing guitar for them, and he got tired of it and decided to quit, so uh, they needed another guitar player. And, you know, John was talking me up. Also, my friend Billy Wolf, who really was the reason that I started playing guitar, he was very uh, musical, and... Um, we ended up both going to Menlo together. So he actually tried out before I did. So I came in after him, and I'm sure they liked his playing. He, he played kind of like uh, Michael Bloomfield from yeah. Paul Butterfield Band. Yeah. But luckily, I, I broke out the slide guitar. And the first song we did was Moonlight Drive, and that was it, man. They, they loved it. 
And Jim was already kind of showing his crazy side, even on that first rehearsal. Yeah, that was kind of weird. Some guy knocks on the door, and Jim grabs him and drags him into the bathroom. <laughs> we heard a lot of yelling and screaming. I guess the guy had ripped Jim off on some marijuana deal. So, uh, yeah, I hadn't seen that side of Jim before. You know, he'd always been very, just the nicest guy and yeah. uh, very laid back. So, uh, yeah, that was the first time I saw the other side of Jim. What was the first Doors gig? First Doors gig, I don't know if you call it a Doors gig, but it was at Ray's dad's work. He actually worked at Hughes Aircraft, kind of like my dad, and they were having a big, uh, some kind of party at Hughes, and we were the band. Was it actually in an airplane hangar? Um, it was more like a big office kind of building. Oh, okay. Just picturing the acoustics. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was not bad acoustics. It was yeah. high, high ceiling. They even had a stage. Uh, and it was kind of crazy because Ray decided to take acid that night. And he was kind of on a bummer. Went on a bummer trip. Yeah. And I had some uh, methadrine pills that I had been using to study with at UCLA. Mm. So I gave one to Jim. And Jim and I were both on methadrine. I don't know what John was on. But we didn't play too good. <laughs> and we had a bass player. I'd never met him, but uh, he only had two strings on his bass. I don't know which ones they were, but, <laughs> but uh, he, you know, it was just a very weird gig. Um, yeah. But, but they seemed to like it, you know. And then you did the party for your parents' friends? Yeah, that was the next one. What were you doing uh, material-wise? Did you have well, Moonlight Drive at that point? Yeah, we did have Moonlight Drive. Uh, we had maybe four or five Doors songs. And uh, the rest, we just did blues, you know, James Brown, or whatever we'd been listening to. So it was about half and half, I would say. At what point do you bring Light My Fire into the set? Uh, that was a little later. Do you remember uh, writing it? Oh, yeah. Tell me yeah. about that. It's in the book. It's in the book. I don't want to give too much away, but... Uh, basically, you know, Jim had been writing all the songs. And like I said, we only had four or five of them worked up. And so he said, well, you guys try writing something, you know. Why do I have to do all the work? So I said, okay, well, what would I write about? So he said, you know, write about something really universal, something that, that won't go out of style in the next uh, year or whatever. And um, I guess that's kind of what he tried to do. So I said, okay, something universal. Okay, what's universal? I said, oh, and then I had the idea, earth, air, fire, and water. You know, yeah. those are pretty universal sure. subjects. And I, I always liked that song by the Stones, Play With Fire. Right. So I said, okay, I'm going to write something about fire. So that was where the idea came from. And you were the only one that came in with a song, actually, did <laughs> yeah. the assignment. Yeah, and the other, other guys, uh, they didn't do their lessons. And, and, you know, very few bands have a song that's their first hit that is enduring, that defines them almost. I mean, maybe yeah. Elton John with your song, you know, okay, you know, he's still playing that 50 years later. But yeah. my God, Light My Fire, to say it's a classic sounds like an understatement. Yeah, I mean, there's two sides to that story, you know. The bad part is you have to play it every damn time because, right. you know, that's what people expect. And that, that hasn't been the case lately, but back in the day, we always, you know, that was uh, expected of us, obviously. Yeah, if you hear all your live albums and some of the Blue Lake stuff, there's always that little voice. And, bang, 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 <laughs> you know. and, you know, that was my best song and my first song. And it was a downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like some of my other songs better than Light My Fire, but they never attained the uh, notoriety. Right. Now, initially, you guys were signed to Columbia. Yeah. What went down with that? Now, that was before I was in the band, you know, before I was even around. They had done a demo, and they had Moonlight Drive on it. They had Hello, I Love You and maybe two or three other songs. And there was this guy, Billy James, who uh, I believe he was instrumental in signing Bob Dylan. So he was kind of a big deal, and, and somehow we got the tape to him, and he, he really loved it, and he got them signed to Columbia. That's one reason why I was interested in joining the band, of course, 
you know, how many bands have a deal, a record deal, especially with Columbia. Didn't Jim do something that kind of got that squashed? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it was fortunate or unfortunate, but Billy James had a, a meeting with the uh, brass the top guys, you know, over there about signing uh, the band. They they were signed, but they were kind of on a list of bands that they they sign about thirty bands a month. Like a development there. kind of thing. Yeah, and, and they see which one sticks, yeah. you know. And yeah. So we hadn't really done any gigs or anything. So Jim just insists on going to the meeting with Billy James, and he takes up way too much LSD. And when he came out of the meeting, he said, oh, man, it was great. You guys, don't worry. This is a lock, you know. And then the next day we were fired. (laughs) (laughs) Well, like you said, it was fortunate in a way. Yeah, because Electra turned out to be the perfect uh, label for the Doors. And, you know, every band has like a champion in their corner. The Stones had Andrew Oldham, the Who had Kit Lambert and Chris Stamp. The Doors had Jack Holtzman. Exactly. Talk about what he meant to the band in those days. Well, I mean, he really understood the band more than any other record guy anyway. You know, especially when he heard us do a Whiskey Bar. You know, he said, wow, what kind of band would do a song like that? Yeah, Be um, Penny Opera. Yeah, that's yeah. Penny Opera. And I think that right there clinched it for him because he, he knew that we weren't just your run-of-the-mill teenage rock band. Yeah that it went a lot deeper than that. And when he heard some of Jim's poetry, and it was just a lock. Who did bring that song to the band? Which song? Three Penny Opera one? Yeah, Alabama song. Well, Ray had uh, an album of the Three Penny Opera. Ray had a great record collection, and he would play us all this stuff. And that was one that he really liked. We said, yeah, yeah why don't we do that, you know? I mean, we had to change it around quite a bit, you know, to oh, get yeah. uh, rock and roll, but... Yeah. Just the words alone were so cool. Found out later that the guy was really talking about the uh, American soldiers that came over to Germany during the war. Yeah. Yeah, they were all young and inexperienced. And the song is actually talking about the soldiers and how they got to experience like whorehouses and stuff like that. It's another timeless topic. Yeah, exactly. Now, you guys spent a lot of time developing your sound and your stage act by playing, I guess, the London Fog first and later, like the Troubadour. And you were gigging alongside some up-and-comers like Chambers Brothers and Van Morrison, Linda Ronstadt. Were you picking many things up from them? Um, I don't really think so. I, I, you know, we had our own thing. It was so different. I was picking up stuff from guys like uh, Bob Dylan and John Corner. You ever heard of him? Yeah. Kerner, Ray, and Glover. They had a couple of albums out on Electra Records that were actually produced by Paul Rothschild, which was another crazy coincidence. That My favorite records were produced by Paul Rothschild, who was going to be our producer. Yeah. I said, wow, that's amazing. You know, that, that just uh, blew my mind. What was the moment when you kind of looked around and knew that you guys had really made it, that the impact was going to be substantial? Oh, probably when we heard uh, Light My Fire on the radio, number one. And a highway billboard doesn't happen most <laughs> bands every day either. Yeah, that, yeah, they actually put up that billboard before Light My Fire was a hit, I believe. Yeah, because it, it the billboard said Break On Through. Right, which was the first single. Right, which didn't do that well. Yeah. <laughs> But for Electra, it did well. It was it made it to number 40, and they, they never had anything like that. They had uh, Love, Arthur Lee and Love. Oh, yeah. I think they're, they're one of their songs made it to number 80 or something. I had never heard the story before. But right at the start of your popularity, all four of you received draft notices for Vietnam. That's like getting a terminal diagnosis. I mean, <laughs> it's not, at least back then, you know, your whole life must have flashed before your eyes. Well, that was uh, not good. But, you know, a lot of our friends had had gotten draft notices, and there was a whole bunch of people that managed to get out of it. You know, some of of my buddies were, like, gung-ho, and they wanted to go, and they did. But I would say 80 90% of them just were looking for a way out. A lot of them moved to Canada and stuff like that. Right. I actually uh, went to a psychiatrist (laughs) and had him write a a note that I was crazy. (laughs) And at that point, that still worked. You know, I think they saw through that after a while. But. And Jim got out of it. And yeah, and we, we really never found out how he did it. 
Wow. Because most guys, when they when they get their uh, designation, it's either one uh, Y, which means you have to come back in a year, or four F, which means they don't ever want you. Well, Jim got a Z. What's that? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> he must have done something pretty crazy to get a Z. You know, if it was anybody else, I would have thought to myself, maybe his dad being an admiral. Uh, uh, could have got him out, but I doubt that was the situation. I no, I absolutely not. I'm sure his dad would have loved it if he was drafted. Yeah. But come to think of it, just when you said that, I realized maybe the fact that his dad was an admiral, they probably figured, uh, hey, this guy's crazy. He's going to make Admiral Morrison look like bad, you know? Uh. <laughs> yeah. Goddamn, I just thought of that. Put me in the next book. <laughs> well, I could. I could put you in the Strax part of it. Cool. You know, invariably, I always ask my guests about memories of their best gig, their worst gig. What the doors is, so many of your individual shows are legendary. You only have to say New Haven, Miami. Everyone knows what you're talking about. Right. But are there any specific dates that stick out in your mind as a favorite live experience with the band? Well, I mean, just being at the Whiskey every night, that was very cool. And then playing at the Fillmore the first time was amazing. You know, we never played in San Francisco, so... And the Fillmore was it, you know? Yeah. You know, that was like the place to play. I think we played with the Rascals. There's a great anecdote surrounding you guys playing the University of Michigan in 67. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was probably our worst gig ever. <laughs> we were driving over there. Everything was fine. And we saw this uh, ice cream shop. And John and Ray and I said, hey, let's stop and get some ice cream. And, you know, that place looks like really like a uh, homemade looking place. Back then, they didn't have 31 flavors and shit. It was right. just, and for some reason, that, that rubbed Jim the wrong way. You know, he thought ice cream was for kids or something. He said, oh, no thanks. I'll, I'll go to the bar next door. And he, <laughs> he went to the bar and overdid it as usual but really overdid it. And by the time we got to the gig, he was just, he didn't know what the hell was going on. Mm -hmm. So we get up on stage and we couldn't find him. He was somewhere in the building, but so, all right, let's just start playing, he'll come up. We start playing, no gym. It took him about 20 minutes to find the stage. So now he gets up there and he don't want to sing door songs. He says, no, let's do a blues, you know. Uh, <laughs> And pretty soon, John and I got so pissed off, we just left the stage. And people were booing, and, and Ray tried to stick it out, tried playing some blues <laughs> with Jim. And pretty soon, he couldn't take it. People were throwing shit and booing. It was a mess. I don't think we got paid. Um, the one cool thing that happened was that in the audience was Iggy Pop. Mm -hmm. And he had never seen a rock and roll show. And he loved it. <laughs> he thought, I'm going to do that. I want to do that. That's what started his career. It probably was pretty damn interesting to watch. <laughs> well, for him it was. I, I, I mean, a lot of people booed and walked out. But he thought it was so crazy that uh, it piqued his interest. I remember there was a um, quasi-documentary called The Doors Are Open, which kind of included, I think, the European tour. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I think Granada TV put it on. When I was a little kid, they would show it on an independent mm -hmm. channel. If I was lucky, I get to see it like once a year. Yeah, um, that was uh, one of my favorite. Great performance footage. You guys own any of that footage now? Um, I I really don't know. I think so. Is there stuff think, we haven't seen? <laughs> I wish. I wish. Yeah. I mean, you know, we still find clips and stuff that people have kept all this time, but they're getting fewer and fewer and worse quality. <laughs> You know, all, all the good stuff has been showed. Yeah, yeah. There is uh, some stuff from New Orleans, which was our last gig ever. We've been negotiating with that guy for years. And that's that video or just audio? Yeah, it's video. Oh, because I've heard the audio in bootlegs. Yeah, right. Probably the only time you guys did right is on the Storm Live. Yeah, could be, because yeah. it was right after we recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of that, there was an open show. In the opening segment, when the music's over, is playing, and... My God, doing your solo, you're getting a sustain like I've never heard from another guitar player. You're hitting notes that go on for days. What were you using for gear back then? 
Now, are you talking about the recorded version? or? Oh, or I'm sorry. The, no, live. Just incredible sound. Well, uh, all I had was a uh, Gibson Maestro fuzz tone, okay? And the amp was an acoustic 260 head, but I had worked on it. <laughs> you know, I had JBLs in there and, yeah. and a bigger amplifier. But, you know, the sound I got in, in the studio was with the same kind of gear, except with a twin reverb. Paul Rothschild had this little gizmo in his uh, briefcase, and I said I wanted a really lot of sustain, like almost like a violin, real smooth, you know. So he stuck this resistor or whatever the hell it was into one of the channels of the board, of the mixing board. And uh, I wish I could get that thing again. <laughs> Yeah, because of the album version, there's actually two solos going on at once, one on the right, one on the left. Right. And the sound, to me, is the the best sound I've ever got on any record or a show. Did you work the two solos out, or were there just two takes that happened to work together? It was just two takes that mistakenly were played together. <laughs> so it was just luck. That's beautiful when those things happen. Yeah, exactly. So what do you have coming up? So I've got this, uh, it's kind of jazz, it's kind of R&B, it's instrumental, and um, I've got these great four-piece. The drummer is Franklin Vanderbilt, who plays with Lenny Kravitz. The uh, bass player, we call him Brandino, Kevin Brandon, he played with Aretha Franklin for years, and he was on some Michael Jackson stuff. And uh, the keyboard guy, Ed Roth, He's played with Annie Lennox and Joe Walsh, all these people. So these guys are like world-class uh, musicians, you know. Yeah. And we did this album last year. Not sure what we're going to call it yet, but uh, this one song called Samosas and Kingfishers. Uh, I do it with a sitar, an electric sitar, you know. And uh, there's some pretty cool stuff. So uh, I'm sure you look out for that. I know quite a few years back you toured with Eric Burden. Yeah. And I heard some uh, you know, great wild stories thrown in that adventure, but I want to ask you, because Eric's known well, for being a bit cantankerous at times. Who was the hotter front man to work with, Eric Burden or Jim Morrison? <laughs> well, you know, by the time I, I, I got to play with Eric, he was uh, getting up there in, in age, I guess. So, you know, it's not really a fair comparison. But, uh, yeah, he's sure fun to play with, and he, he, he could be a little crazy on stage as well. But I'm sure he was a lot crazier back back in the day. Weren't we all? No, I'm getting crazier <laughs> as the time goes on. <laughs> no man more less day more. From the Doors final recorded LP as a trio after Jim Morrison's death, that's the Mosquito, sung by the great Robbie Krieger, who I can't thank enough for coming on the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast. Obviously we had a very limited amount of time with him, and I'm hoping to have him back on the show sometime soon. There were about 278 more questions we just never got around to, so maybe next time. Be sure to check out Robbie's autobiography, Set the Night on Fire. Links to purchase it are available in the show notes. We're going to leave you now with an It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast exclusive, new yet-to-be-released music from Robbie Krieger called Samosas and Kingfishers. And until next time, thanks for listening to the It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast.